Salguete, discípuli. Soy el tutorísimo, tu profesor favorito, y en el día de hoy te traigo el tema 4 de cuarto de la ESO, de sección, que es The Industrial Revolution and the Class Society. Como siempre, usando los materiales que con tanto amor os preparo, que es la presentación que os voy a mostrar, y los apuntes que tenéis disponibles para su descarga e impresión en el aula virtual. Venga, vamos a ello que... vamos a ello. So, <coughs> this is the fourth unit of this year, the Industrial Revolution and the Class Society, and we are going to study all of these topics, so we are going to talk about all of them. First, the causes or the factors of the Industrial Revolution. Later, the development of the industry, of the main industries in this first Industrial Revolution. Later, the expansion of the Industrial Revolution throughout all Europe and the world. And finally, we are going to end the unit with uh, or talking about society, the new class society and the appearance or the emergence of the labor movement. So. Uh, first, we have to define what was the Industrial Revolution. And it is, or it was, it is all this set of changes that occurred in, during the second, or starting in the second half of the 18th century in England or in Great Britain. All these changes were economic, were technological, and were social uh, changes and this was um, a process that lasted like um, all of the second half of the 18th century and most of the 19th century and they started here and this is how it uh, they shaped England and this is how England became or transformed into after or at the end of this process. So, let's start with the causes, with the so-called factors of the Industrial Revolution. So, traditionally, uh, the causes of the Industrial Revolution are divided in five um, smaller, like mini-revolutions. And they were a demographic revolution, an agricultural revolution, technological revolution, a transportation revolution, and a financial revolution. And all of this and developed into the industrial capitalism and also it um, uh, made the class society uh, the one uh, that is going to be in our capitalist society in, uh, until today. Let's start with the first one and maybe the most important and the first one that happened which is the agricultural revolution. Here, this all or this set of changes that uh, appear in the agriculture and in the countryside. First, there were some changes in the cultivation system. We switched from a three-field system that came from the um, medieval times to the, uh, a new uh, rotation system, which is known as the Norfolk system or the four-field rotation system. This means that the fields or the land was divided into four parts and in each one of the uh, of these parts they cultivated the following barley grass or clover wheat and turnips so we have two cereal parts of the land and two uh, legumes or grass or any uh, any how do you say this uh, any fodder uh, cultivation land so for feeding the livestock in the other two parts so and this rotated every year so this is the if this is the first year the second year barley will be here grass here wheat here and turnips here these two um, crops they uh, they didn't uh, they nourished the land and uh, so they uh, recovered it after the cultivation of the cereals and this provided of course more production because the hundred percent of the land is cultivated there is no uh, no fallow my barbecho and also it provided more manure to fertilize the land it provided more meat since we can feed more livestock and also more 
milk, and this in altogether improved human nutrition. So this is the evolution. First, the two uh, the two field crops uh, crop system, then the three field crop system, and then the Norfolk system. Also, there were other, uh, there were other agricultural improvements. There were new crops that were massively cultivated, like potatoes or corn, and also they started to use the first chemical fertilizers. Then we have to talk about the changes in the ownership system. So in the old system, there were this type of common lands like these meadows and also the common forest where you can have uh, this free grass for your livestock and you can get free logs for your uh, for heating your home. But well, and also the lands were cultivated in this open field system, which means that there were no fences and, and the lands were very huge and uh, cultivated by all the community. They were exploited, all this land, in community. This was not a very productive um, system, but it, it was the system we had. In this time, in the second half of the 18th century in England, this open field system that you are looking, that you are observing right now, was replaced by the enclosures. Because in England, they, uh, the rise of the price of cereals, they made the owners to, um, they started to enclose the land. They started to fence of the land to build this kind of fences so they started to seize all this land and many of this land it would be it could be uh, all, uh, private property but it could also be part of this common land and this was promoted by some laws called the enclosure acts so this replaced these communal lands with private properties and this was mandatory so you had to enclose your land and this costs money so many small peasants couldn't afford to fence off their properties their private land so they were forced to sell them to the rich owners to the uh, great land owners so instead of working their own land they were forced to uh, work as laborers, as they laborers in exchange of a salary. So this meant that all of this common land, this open field and this common land, after the enclosures, they, they were mostly property of a few land owners and they also seized a great part of these previous common lands, as you can see here in these pictures. Okay, do you see the difference? And this made that, uh, that the, the consequence of this was that a large number of peasants were unemployed, were jobless, and many of them had to now work for a landowner, but the most of them had to migrate to the cities. But we will discuss that later. Then we have the introduction of new machinery. There were new machines were invented that uh, allowed this all these agricultural tasks like like seeding to be carried out more easily and mostly more efficiently and in a cheaper way the most important one maybe it is this jethro or jethro i don't know how to pronounce these tools seed drill who uh, or that allowed the peasants to uh, seed the um, the fields very very faster and also very uh, way more cheaper than before because you only need two people to seed a big land so this allowed uh, with a few men to sow in these parallel rows the, and it this machine distributed the seeds regularly which was uh, which was very good for for uh, the work in the, the countryside also there are some others like the Rothers, Rotherham's Rotherham plow and that improved the previous one which was um, the plow that was uh, used from the uh, or since the middle ages and then 
and other machines like the reaper machine or the cotton gin or the threshing machine and finally well you can see here more examples and finally the combined harvester that came way later but i still i wanted to show it to show you in this uh, presentation so as a consequence of this agrarian revolution there was an increase a great increase in agricultural produ production the nutrition improved but also the, con the land of uh, the land ownership was concentrated in a few owners and there were there was a reduction in the number of peasants since the machines were introduced so they <clears throat> the owners uh, got a lot more profits from the land work then we have the demographic revolution and it, this is a consequence of the agricultural revolution since we uh, there are there is a, a increased food production and also there is going to be improvements in medicine and hygiene we can afford to feed more people and the death rate is start is going to start to drop no to become lower so if the births are more or less the same but the death rate is 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 lowering then uh, the population is going to increase and it's going to increase a lot as you can see here if the death the death rate drops but the birth rate keeps uh, its its uh, level then the population is growing exponentially and this means that most of the countries almost doubled their population in the first years of the industrial revolution and you can see here this is the industrial revolution then it started a change in the trend of the population growth that lasts until today one of these uh, well uh, we know about the increase uh, in food production because of the agricultural revolution the improvements in medicine and hygiene uh, were mostly the invention of the vaccine by edward jenner in 1796 we talked about this in the first unit if i recall correctly and uh, this was a vaccine for the cowpox and also there were some other uh, important vaccines like the pasteur's uh, vaccines for rabies and also they started to study the diseases in a scientific way for example it is very famous the john snow's cholera map because the epidemics in the cities were very common and they also started to uh, worry about this and there were some inventions to improve the hygiene in the cities like the public or urinals so people don't pee in the middle of the street and also the constructions of the building of the sewage systems alcantarillado and this is the london sewage system which is very famous and it still it is still working nowadays finally this also meant that the, there was a, a huge increase in life expectancy here you can see it uh, it, there was it was 36 years in the year 1801 and it started to grow 40 45 50 and in the 20th century until the 80 years that is more or less today this also meant this uh, demographic revolution that uh, a consequence was the growth of the cities there was a lot of urban growth that was that was stimulated by the construction of industries and these industries were built in the outskirts of the cities since they need uh, the industries need or needed a lot of workforce this workforce is going to come from the countryside all these peasants that were expelled from their land because of the enclosures are going to migrate to the cities they're going to establish in the cities and they're going to work for the industries they are going to be the new workers of these new industries this uh, urban growth this migration is called rural exodus el exodo rural these peasants that now need to work they are they don't have any land they don't have any job they are going to become the new proletariat the new workers of the industries in the cities and they are going to live in these working class neighborhoods then 
the technological revolution and this started maybe with the uh, maybe one of the greatest inventions of history which is the invention of the steam ma machine uh, no the steam engine sorry uh, which was invented in 1769 by this guy James Watt and this uh, machine which uh, it, it uses it used steam to generate a continuous movement it uh, transformed the heat uh, energy from steam or from boiling water into kinetic um, energy so this machine was used to move any kind of other this engine was used to move any kind of machine and this this steam machine here you can see several example and examples and here you have a video showing how it works that we are not going to <clears throat> to to play now this allowed the mechanization which is the use of machines to produce goods now they are going to start we are going to start to see factories which are buildings that shelter these machines and these machines first are going to be moved by by water but this uh, this uh, water wheels but later but this steam engine so the factories that they don't need to be placed near a, a water source and um, this uh, mechanization as you can see here these steam engines made uh, moved all this transmission system that moved the machines with this kind of leather belts that you can see here or for example here in these factories this is the transmission system these are the pulleys and the leather belts and here this is the principle of every factory okay the transmission of this movement from the steam engine to the needed machines okay and uh, first, um, they were moved by the water, later by the use of coal. This made, uh, as, as I said, this building, these factories and this factory system which involved mass production. Then we have the transport revolution and this is the result of the application of the steam engine to the vehicles. And this made the movement of goods and people faster, cheaper and they could carry more goods or people the main two vehicles that were invented during this time were the steamboat and the railroad the steamboat el barco de vapor was invented in 1807 by robert fulton this is a replica of the first uh, steamboat which is the clermont and it was moved with this paddle wheel that was um, also uh, as well moved by this steam engine here and later there were they were invented the iron hull el casco de hierro and the propeller la hélice and these were the first boats the first ships that civil and military ships that used both of these inventions then we have the railroad the railroad uh, started when where the first locomotives were invented which is uh, not which is no other thing that a mobile steam engine which is capable of dragging wagons and these first railways the first uh, commercial well there were several ones before the one i'm going to mention but the first one which is um, which had a commercial use was the uh, rocket by stephenson which was invented in 1829 and with this rocket the first railroad which was operated in 1830 between Manchester and Liverpool Opa. this line here this railroad here this was uh, <clears throat> opened in 1830 and as you can see the railroad developed very very fast throughout Europe except in Spain because we are always late for everything and this increase or this revolution in transportation of course made uh, or as a result there was a huge increase in trade since now the vehicles can carry more goods and they are way faster than before. So uh, this meant that trade growth uh, grew a lot. The growth of trade was very 
uh, very huge and this is how I illustrate it with the constructions of the new London dogs or the West India dogs in the beginning of the uh, 19th century in the river Thames. Finally, we have the last mini revolution of the Industrial Revolution, the Financial Revolution. Because since there are going to be a lot of industries that were are going to be created, <clears throat> they are going to demand uh, more and more capital. So we are going to start to, um, to see the first limited partnerships like these small companies, which are uh, finan financed by small partners which contributed with the capital and also we are going to start to see the first great corporations like this the american express which capital whose capital was divided into small participations and these participations are called shares for example here you have a 500 dollars share of the american express company son acciones and with these shares, if you acquired one of these shares, you shared the benefits but also the risks of the company. And the increase of these great corporations made the, the stock or, or uh, led to the appearance of the great stock exchanges, a places or they were they were places where you can buy and sell these shares, and also. Uh, besides the appearance of these stock exchanges like uh, New York or Paris or London, we have the appearance or, or the multiplication because they were uh, they uh, existed already of banks and these banks you can invest all this capital that or you can keep all this capital that or save it that this uh, new capitalist, this, this new industry or company owners are starting to, uh, to create. And this generalization of all the establishment, these corporations, stock exchanges and banks, originated the so-called financial capitalism, which is based, uh, in which wealth is based on obtaining profits through the purchase of shares and also financial products. So this is or this would be the summary of this first part of the factors of the Industrial Revolution. Then what happened with this? Well, the industry developed a lot. And in this first Industrial Revolution, there are two industries that developed uh, above others, which are the textile and the steel industry or the ferrous metallurgy industry. First, the textile industry that um, suffered with these uh, technical innovations and also it developed a lot because of the in increased demand for cotton fabrics and why is why was that because of the increase in population we talked about in the agricultural and demographic revolution so since there was a lot of or the demand of cotton fabric increased a lot they need to produce more and this is why there uh, the mechanization first um, affected this industry as you can see here with all of these spinning machines and there were some um, crucial inventions being the first one the flying shuttle which was invented by John Kay in 1733, which increased a lot the speed of the weaving process. Here you have several videos, so you can see how it worked. Then there was some other invention with uh, a lot of new spinning machines, the water frame of Rich, uh, Richard Arkwright or the spinning jenny by John Hargreaves. And no, I don't want to see any video, okay, no and the spinning mule by Crompton and finally we go to the uh, other great invention which is the mechanical loom, el telar mecánico, by Edward Cartwright in 1785 which also speed a lot the, um, the production of fabrics. Finally we have the Eli Whitney's cotton gin to uh, separate the, the um, good and the bad parts of the cotton as you can see here in this video. Okay, so also mining also increased 
a lot because uh, we need coal and uh, to uh, because it's a great energy source to power the steam engines so coal mining developed a lot as you can see here also they need to extract iron for the industry we are going to see right now which is the ferrous metallurgy industry and later the steel industry and this also developed this industry also developed a lot since the demand of iron also increased a lot why because we needed or they needed to manufacture a lot of new uh, vehicles or objects as, such as ships ammunition and of course the machines and the tools that were used in the industry and there were also some inventions that were crucial they started to produce these in blast furnaces which we call altos hornos and also there was invented uh, some uh, techniques to improve iron works such as the paddling by Henry Cort are also rolling and finally at the end of the 19th century the Bessemer converter allowed the manufacture of steel which is a greater uh, a better metal a better material for the construction of everything machinery buildings tools etc etc as you can see here with the first iron bridge in England okay so that's it then we have the expansion of the Industrial Revolution because we know that the Industrial Revolution started in England in the second half of the 18th century but after Great Britain there were several countries that also adopted the industrialization more or less around 1830 and the first ones as you can see here in this map were Belgium France and um, lo diré, Germany and we only know to um, to know that okay these were the first ones that uh, became industrialized because uh, well because they are close to Great Britain and also because they have a lot of coals uh, coal uh, coal mines in their territory and after that there were some late industrialization countries such as the united states later spain portugal italy austria russia or even japan are among these countries okay well also the united states also was one of the first countries that were industrialized because they had great relations after the wars with great britain so this is all about the industrial revolution and this industrial revolution uh, transformed society into a new type of society which is called the class society so with capitalism there were new social classes that emerged and the two main ones were the bourgeoisie and the proletariat the high class the bourgeoisie here and the proletariat the lower class these were uh, open social group so there were some social mobility this means that you can switch classes you can become part of the high class or you can drop to the lower class this is why uh, why is this because now the classes are determined by the financial status of the individual so it's determined by wealth if you became rich enough you became part of the bourgeoisie you can afford you could uh, you could be an owner of the um, means of production so uh, among the bourgeoisie the bourgeoisie is going to be the ruling class they are going to gain political power they are going to be very rich and they are going to um, to be the owners of the means of production this wealth came from uh, being the owners of these new industries that are created all these new businesses and also because they were the ones who bought all these new lands in the countryside that are also provided them a good source of money and this bourgeoisie as you can see had a very good and um, and um, a very cool lifestyle and then we have the lower class which is the proletariat the proletariat is is formed by this huge amount of workers 
of the industries. They are the industrial workers. These were the former peasants that were ex expelled from their lands and also former artisans which were ruined by the introduction of machines in the factories and both of them are going to become the new workers of the new established industries and uh, they, are, they have a very poor lifestyle because their working conditions were very harsh for example long working hours, very low wages, noise, diseases, smoke and also uh, the, well, as you can see, these uh, women, at least in the bourgeois women, lived in a comfortable situation, more or less, as you can see here. But also the proletariat women, the working women, besides taking care of the home and the children, they have, or they had to work as well, mostly in the textile industry. So we have this new society this is the pyramid of the capitalist system this is the proletariat they work for all and they feed all of the rest of the pyramid the bourgeoisie soldiers clergy uh, political rulers and on top of that is the capital the money the capitalism and as we mentioned before they are going to live in separate neighborhoods in the cities so the working class are going to have their own neighborhoods uh, next to the working areas, the industrial zones, while the bourgeoisie are going to live in new open, clean areas, which are called mostly en Sanchez, for example, in Spain, where, uh, as you can see here, they were very, uh, which are the most beautiful parts of the city. In uh, on the contrary, we have the, these working class neighborhoods where smoke, the dirty, the dirt and the diseases were re really common. And you can see here the difference between the houses, the homes of a bourgeois and of a proletariat. And here you can see these new neighborhoods with the expansion of these uh, bourgeois neighborhoods here, as you can see in both the cases of Madrid and Barcelona. Here you have the summary again, and then we go to the last, um, lo diré, the last uh, part of the unit, and maybe the most interesting, perhaps the labor movement, el movimiento obrero. And this uh, labor movement started because of the misery of their proletariat. This he, their political marginalization. They, they couldn't participate in the in the government remember that this is also the time of the first liberal revolution and of course the lack of the labor legislation which allowed these harsh working conditions that we have just talked about so this induced this uh, proletariat to organize themselves and to um, to try to improve both their political and economical situation so first there are going to be some uh, workers' associations, but before that, the first labor movement was Ludism. Ludism is this kind of labor movement which consisted in acts of protest against mechanization, against the machines. The workers, mostly of the textile industry, at the beginning of the 19th century in England, they destroyed the um, the machines of the factories. Here they are hammering a loom, well, a lot of mechanical looms, and this is called ludism because they made the machines responsible for the low wages and the workers' unemployment. And, and this is called ludism in honor or after Ned Lud, which is the guy who allegedly um, led this movement, but there are no any there is no evidence that, that this guy existed in real life but still they he gave the name of, for this movement after that the first workers associations were created these were mutual aid societies or also called friendly societies whose members paid a fee and received help in case of illness or dismissal because if you got ill for example in your workplace the owner didn't pay you any kind of salary even though it was an accident so they created these contingency funds to fund all these um, 
solve these problems. Then, after that, the first these associations evolved into trade unions. These, these were these were official worker associate workers associations to uh, whose objectives were to improve working conditions. For example, they wanted to work less hours a day, less than sixteen hours. Uh, they wanted an increase in wages. They wanted some political rights rights, for example, the right to vote, and also. They uh, and how did they protest? For example, they were they did negotiations, they did demonstrations, and finally they did strikes. And here you have some banners of these trade unions. They started in Great Britain. At first, they were forbidden, but later, after some protests, they were allowed more or less, like by 1825. And after this. The well, the the labor movement is not going to be limited to the economical struggle, but also the political struggle. And here we are going to uh, to witness the arose of the first political theories: Cartesian, socialism, and anarchism. So. The workers at this time, the workers began the political struggle for equal rights with the bourgeoisie, and first the first one was Cartesian in Great Britain. This is this name comes after the so-called People's Charter of 1838, which was a document presented in the British Parliament. Here, this is the document in which. The London Workers Association demanded a series of rights. You have he, you have them here: the universal suffrage, so they wanted the workers to vote. The no property qualification, so everybody could be voted. Annual parliaments, equal representation between bourgeois, uh, bourgeois and uh, proletariat districts. The payment of the members of the parliament, so the working men could present themselves as or could. Uh, uh, could be allowed to be members of the parliament, so they could be paid, and finally the vote by ballot, so the vote could be secret, and there so there wouldn't be any kind of retaliation from the factory owners. And at uh, this, uh, well, was a failure, but it started, it planted the seed of the later movements, and this, all these. Um, all these claims are going to be fulfilled, but at a later date, within the 19th century. Then we have maybe the most important theories of the of the labor movement, and the first one, the most important one, is socialism, and um, specifically Marxism. This scientific socialism was uh, theorized by two German thinkers, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. They wrote it in this uh, book, uh, well, the first book that started all of this was the Communist Manifesto of 1848, El Manifiesto Comunista. Here, they wanted, as you can see in these texts, I'm not going to read the text, but you can pause the video and you can open this presentation in the, well, the files in the virtual classroom. They wanted to put an end to private property, so to the ownership of the means of production by individuals. And they wanted that because they said this was the cause of the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie, they are the owners of the means of production, and the proletariat had to sell their workforce in exchange of a salary. And this made the class struggle to exist. And this had happened, they say that this had happened all throughout history, the class conflict, but there were several, there was a slight difference. No? For example, uh, first there was this uh, slavery stage, then the feudalism, then capitalism, in which there was only, there was, there was always, I mean, an oppressed class and an oppressing class. In the case of capitalism, the oppressing class is the bourgeoisie and the oppressed class is the proletariat. So they wanted to achieve socialism, in which, well, actually communism, but first we have to achieve socialism, in which the oppressing class 
is the state managers and the press class is the workers. This is a transitory stage and the mean the great objectives is a classless society. So if there, there are no classes, there is no class struggle. And this happens there. This oppression from the bourgeoisie to the proletariat happens because of the extraction of the surplus value. The surplus is the difference between the wealth created by the working class and the wages they receive. Marx said that the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, got rich because they kept this surplus. They, they kept all this, the difference, all this wealth created by labor in exchange of giving them in the wages to the working class. So this has to end. And how? The proletariat has to organize and to take the power, the political power. They, they need to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, a workers, um, a workers state in which the state owns. So the workers owns all the means of production and with this they could achieve the classless society. Then the other great ideology was anarchism, which is more or less similar in its objectives. They want to end with the um, oppression from the bourgeoisie, but in a different way. The most important thinkers were, well, the most important thinker was this guy here, Mikhail Bakunin, but there were some others like Pierre Joseph Proudhon. And they defended individual freedom above all, so they wanted to end with any kind of oppression, not only from the bourgeois, but also from the political power, also from the state. So they wanted the destruction of the state because they allowed the state allowed the exploitation of the working class. And uh, this why this since they rejected the state, they didn't participate in politics. So they only made uh, trade unions. The most famous one, for example, La Confederación Nacional del Trabajo in Spain and the CGT in France that still exist today. So uh, we have the Marxists and the anarchists in the which are participating in the workers conflict and at first they proposed the union of all the workers from all over the world and this is called proletarian internationalism and this uh, led to the creation of the first international associations of workers we are going to study the two uh, the two first ones which uh, which were the following first this i uh, iwa the international workers association this is also called the uh, work at the first international. It was created in 1864 and it was composed of both uh, Marxists and anarchists. But uh, very soon they're going to arouse some discrepancies, mostly become, uh, between socialists and anarchists, and the anarchists are going to be expelled from this international while the socialists kept the control and also encouraged the formation of these socialist parties in each country. For example, El PSOE in Spain, founded by Pablo Iglesias in 1879. So this led to the expel of these anarchists and later in 1889, only the socialist, only the Marxist founded was the so-called Second International and they wanted to coordinate all of these newly created socialist parties. And this second international, here you have some of the leaders, this second international was responsible of the creation of the working class symbols that still are still exist today. For example, the red flag, which uh, symbolizes the blood spilled by the workers in their fights, also the Working class anthem, which is the Internationale. Here you have the version in English and the version in Spanish. And finally, after one uh, one protest in Chicago, the High Market Revolt in 1886, where they demanded the eight-hour working day, some workers of the Chicago Industries. On the first of May, there were several deaths, and in their memory, they um, the Second International established the May the first as the May Day or the International Workers' Day. 
which is still uh, is uh, celebrated today, el primero de mayo. And that's all for this uh, for this last part of the labor movement. Here you have the summary, a great summary because it's very uh, long, and we end the unit with this. Madre mía, bueno, eh, tres cuartos de hora no está mal. Espero que dentro de lo que cabe, pues, os haya ayudado este vídeo en algo. Y ya sabéis que cualquier duda me la podéis comentar por los canales habituales. No se olviden de seguir este canal y suscribirse y darle like y todas esas mierdas. Y nos vemos en el próximo. Adiós.